Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Tom Batista. He's going to tell you a great story about touring with David Bowie. Well, first day we're in uh, Pete Feller's shop in Newburgh, New York. Huge. It's a B-52 hangar, and they have every department set up. So there's a welding department, a painting department, a prop department, and then there's a stage set up, you know, at one end. It's where, you know, people could rehearse or whatever. But so... First time David came to see the set, he, he wanted to come and check it out. We had put together this bridge, and so it was uh, it went 25 feet in the air. It was 25 feet wide between these towers, and it started up at the top, and David would come out of this scaffolding and onto it and sing changes, and it would come down and stop halfway. And then uh, so the first time he shows up to go, to see the set and everything, he wants to try it out. Well, we had gone to lunch, and the electricians, they put three or four lamp posts on this uh, elevator, basically. It was a bridge that went up and down. And so that way, and so we could run it, everything was fine, but David's probably weighed 98 pounds, maybe 120, maybe. And so he wants to see it. He wants to try the cue, and they're going to give me a thing when to make it go because I didn't really know the song or anything at that time. And they come down, you know, ten feet. It was supposed to stop fifteen feet off the stage. It went all the way to the to the deck and hit the floor. The brake didn't work because the overweight. <laughs> so he goes, "Who's running that?" Or so you know, he goes something, and he comes over to me. I had to raise my hand and, <laughs> and say, "That's as I said. That's as fast as it'll ever go." because we had put counterweights on it and everything. But I had no idea if that was true or not. I just said it in the moment. And uh, that night, we stayed all night, and we actually put a Porsche brake on this. It was an electromagnetic motor that was supposed to stop, but so we had a, a way to stop it no matter what. So that was kind of the... That's the first time I met David. Was he pissed off in that No, moment? no, he was not pissed off. He was a pretty cool dude about the... Well, he was excited to see the whole set, you know, the concept drawings and... They had little models. There's that model is still around somewhere. They, on his tour, they took his stuff around. They, they, there's a model of that set there, and so he had seen the models, and you know he had worked on doing it. He was totally into it. You know, he's not just about the music. He's about the show. Well, that those were the days that were, the band, and the crew, and David, traveled together, and stayed in the same hotels. The our accountants and the you know, the attorneys and all those people, the greedy people weren't around yet. So it was just like a traveling show and we were all together, you know, uh, going around. And that's, you I mean, I, that was a really exciting time to be there. Um, so although David would never fly, so we would fly places and he wouldn't fly. He would take a limo. <laughs> he just didn't like flying. He actually wrote, he came over to America on the Queen Mary because <laughs> he didn't like to fly. And then in between things, he would just take a limo. <laughs> they would just drive him, you know, to wherever. And he had a personal assistant, uh, Corinne Schwab. I remember that. She took care of his mundane, everyday needs. No matter what he wanted, she could take care of it. You know, he didn't have to go shopping or do it. He, he probably could have gone shopping then. That was early on, so that was in 73 and 74. Uh, he was having a fight with uh, Tony DeFries. I can't remember the name of his company. Main Man Management, I think was the name of it. He was having a fight with him. So he was kind of determined that he was going to spend every dime so the promoter couldn't get promoted. So we would have candelabra dinners, <laughs> literally with white tablecloths and candles on the dinner table, service dinners. We'd get to a city, every three people would have a rent a car. And then when we got to New York, every three people got in the limousine and took us, you know, to and the ones the some of the kids were smart enough to say, Hey, let's take this, let's drop our bags and take this limo to a club because you know if we pull up a limo, they're gonna let us in. And so I just wasn't in the club circuit. You know, I like I said, I had bought some land in southern Indiana and I was building a cabin, I was getting ready to drop out of society. Well, it didn't interest me to go to these clubs, but, you know, although when we built the bottom line, I did end up at Max's Kansas City, you know, several times because of Bruce. He needed to go there to um, talk, you know, to other bands to get more work or whatever. 
Well, the best way to explain it was, I guess the tour before was Ziggy Stardust. So they came all, you know, dressed like Ziggy Stardust with, you know, um, lightning bolt uh, makeup and wild clothes and all this stuff. The best way to explain that was when we got to Phoenix. Now, I had an old girlfriend who lived in Phoenix. Now, I've been married to her for 44 years now. But she lived in Phoenix, so I invited her to the show. And so she comes to the show, and she has um, cowboy boots and a cowboy belt, you know, all leathered with a silver buckle and um, <laughs> um, pearl snaps on her shirt and comes into the show. And all these people in tutus. And <laughs> it was hilarious. But so that was kind of the difference between. But David was kind of always in front of his, his uh, followers. He was he was into riding crops in and uh, I don't know that cool thing about that show though that you'll probably like is um, it was a Broadway show so everything was hidden you couldn't see how anything worked you couldn't see speakers were covered you know things were all behind scrims and so there was a lot of paintings and you know painted scrims and things and um, where I operated the the elevator from. Um, on the left-hand side of me was David Sanborn playing a sax, never introduced the audience. And on the other side was um, Luther Vandross. And Luther Vandross, you know, they were never introduced to the audience. And now, you know, they were huge people, but I, it was just kind of funny. Um, and I would hang out with Luther sometimes. We'd go to, um, to the cheapest places we could find to eat because I was saving money for Southern Indiana. I was, you know, I was saving money. And so we would go to like Jack in the Box and I actually had a picture someone took of us, Luther and me, in uh, a Jack in the Box in LA. And um, when he came to town later when he was famous and going out on his own um, and everybody hated him because he was just such a prima donna and just an ass, you know, just mean to everybody. And and they, the local stagehands knew how mean he was. And they said, well, you better be careful. And I went back and I showed him that picture and started talking about hard days on Buffett. And it was just kind of, he was, he was melted. Wow. It, it just kind of brought back the memory of him being a nobody and not being, you know. And actually that whole tour, the Diamond Dogs tour, now that I think about it, uh, David had to do 50 shows. And, and because they got, uh, Jules Fisher got paid so much money every show for 50 shows. And when the 50 shows was over, he said, I've had, I'm not doing it anymore. And we went to Vegas. They, they canceled shows for two weeks and we built uh, an all white set, white psych, white risers and Luther Vandross up on one of the risers. So that was then became kind of the Young Americans tour. It was just kind of, a, it was pretty uh, amazing and fun. If you'd like to hear more David Bowie stories, click on the video in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, subscribe to this channel, and tell me down below what your favorite David Bowie song is, and I'll see you somewhere down the road. Much love to you.